So today on the virtual sofa, we have Polly Scattergood. Hello, Polly. Hello, thanks for inviting me. Thank you for popping over. Um, so the first question is, um, we've had this horrible COVID thing going on for the last two years. It's still hanging out. In fact, my, my brother's girlfriend has got it now. She got it a couple of days ago. Nice. Um, yeah, it's, it's horrible, isn't it? So how did you manage to cope and keep your sanity during all of lockdown and all that malarkey that happened? Um, do you know what? I kind of went into a bit of a, a studio uh, cave <laughs> in my back room. We had just taken on a studio about 20 minutes away from our house mm -hmm. and literally two weeks before lockdown, and then we realized that all of our gear suddenly was not in the house. So we, we did a, a run to the studio, got a few synthesizers, <laughs> a couple of keyboards and brought them back to the house, set up a little studio in the back room with Glenn, uh, Glenn Kerrigan, who I worked on Arrows um, with and who I've worked with a, a lot over the years. Um, so he's my husband. <laughs> so he was in the house, which was kind of handy. So I worked with him writing. And then I started working with uh, Jim Sklavunos, who uh, is an incredible musician and writer. Uh, he's also the drummer in It Came the Bad Seeds. And we started doing these uh, Zoom sessions, which were kind of crackly and you know what it's like sometimes there's the weird delays and stuff but we started kind of trying to embrace the weirdness of it all and then we wrote an EP. Yeah. So you squ squirreled yourself away then and made yourself busy? Yeah pretty much yeah um just just kind of kept my head down and went into my own little cocoon. I do have a four-year-old as well so that kept me pretty busy as well. So. No, oh, we, all, we both went, ooh, then. Ooh. <laughs> we, we do like four-year-olds. <laughs> we have like four had some. So. <laughs> yeah, we have created a while ago. Them, but, uh, yeah, just four-year-old. Yeah. You've got to write music okay. and you've got a four-year-old. It's because uh -huh. they don't need much attention, do they? So. No. <laughs> no What's that it, it, do you have a musical four-year-old? They steal your keyboards? Yeah, I mean, she tries to kind of um, come in. I mean, she, she's actually really into, like, at the moment, like, building things so she's got like a little electronic drill so you're playing the piano and she's like <laughs> but um but yeah she she is pretty musical she she likes playing playing the drums you know that that little building thing that you said was quite cute turns into dismantling things when they have drills don't you <laughs> yeah I have a feeling but I've got quite a lot of stuff that needs fixing in the house I'm quite looking forward to having somebody good at DIY hopefully. don't leave your keyboards lying around <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> fix it mum <laughs> As, as a young Polly, mm -hmm. what was your life like growing up? When did you discover your love of music? What did it for you first? Um, well, I think ever since I can remember, I had music kind of around me. Like the house that we lived in was had a piano in it that was kind of old and a bit out of tune, but we, you know, played all the time and stuff. And then I think the first time I had a real realization that I liked um experimenting with sound I went to I think it was one of my dad's friends house he was playing it he had a guitar and uh, he was trying to teach me some chords on the guitar and he had a tape machine and he recorded some of the song that I was playing because I would write songs as soon as I knew, could play a couple of notes on the thing I would write the song mm -hmm. and he he recorded this whole song really nicely on you know the old tape machines yeah and um, and then he played it to me, but in playing it to me, he also played it to me backwards once, so he turned all the audio backwards. And I remember thinking, wow, I love that. I prefer it backwards and forwards. <laughs> and I think that was the first time that I realized that I kind of, that you could manipulate sound in that way. And that's, I think, when I started really kind of diving into that world. Yeah. Okay. Your, your father was an actor and, and your mom an artist. So, you yeah. You, you grew up in a, a creative household. Yeah, yeah. Did you not want to veer off into one of those, or did you did you try? Um, uh, they, I mean, the, no, I, I'm I'm not very good at either. I I love both. <laughs> I mean, I love painting and stuff, but I do it for fun. Um, and yeah, music was just always my the thing that that kind of gave me that feeling, you know, that kind of um, yeah, the, the shivers feeling. So I always went with that, much to their dismay. I think they wished I got like a, <laughs> a job that, that paid every month. But um, but yeah, 
Did they uh, encourage you to continue your music dream? Yeah, I mean, they were super supportive. They, they were both, you know, really creative people. Um, so I was really lucky in that respect that they that they kind of knew they they knew the pitfalls of um, you know working as an artist because <laughs> um, they were both very much working artists. You know, um, my dad was an actor for twenty years, and then when he had me, he um, he actually started building boats. So they've you know always thought on their feet and just being creative people. So I kind of learned from them. I guess about yeah just um being adaptable and getting good at what you love to do never I think they never pushed me <laughs> into doing it because it's you know it's it's a can be a bit of a, a difficult industry yeah it wasn't building about to get away was it <laughs> probably <laughs> just a thought to know <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like um music it just comes naturally to you. Do you find the songwriting process very organic? Do you, does it just sort of spill out of you? Yeah, I mean, it just always, it just always was there. I never, I've never really been able to, I've never been good at music theory. Never been able to read. If you gave me a, a sheet of music, it would take me half an hour to work out all the notes. Like I've never been that kind of a musician, but give me a guitar, a piano or a synthesizer. And as soon as I'm playing like a chord or something, I just, something comes uh, into my head and it just slowly, it, it has always been quite instinctive. Um, since I think when I was a teenager, it was very like uh, cathartic, you know, it was like getting everything out. And um, then as I've got older, I've become a bit more aware of myself and, and what I put down into the songs. Oh. Where am I speaking to you from? Where are you from or where are we from? <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. We're in Stratford-upon-Avon. Okay, cool. So we're, we're about um, five minutes from, from the river. Oh, nice. But we have a roundabout, just you have to cross the roundabout to get to the river. So oh. we, we get traffic this time. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, be it's beautiful. It's handy because we can, we can walk to restaurants and, and things. And so good. And walk back without getting killed or run over. Or yeah. That's that is crazy. Yeah. We have to dodge the swans. Yeah. There's a swan. Um, <laughs> there's a swan. Cross. I mean, he said the title. In. There's a swan in the town, and he's like a rogue swan. And I'm saying he. I presume it's he. We've said he's he. And he hangs around the fish and chip shop. Oh so God. he's got all the river and everything. All the people throwing bread. He doesn't want that. He hangs around the fish and chip shop. I mean, we just call him Elvis because it's a swan that's down. Attack everyone that's going to the fish and chip shop. Yeah, it's Elvis. <laughs> Anyway, digressing. digressing. Um, what kind of music did you listen to uh, when you were growing up? And did, did that, the usual thing when you got to about 12, 13, did that change dramatically? Uh, when I was growing up, I used to listen to a lot of my, my dad's and my mum's LPs, like um, Jimi Hendrix, Leonard Cohen, you know, all the kind of the greats. Um, they had a, a great vinyl collection. And then as I became a teenager... I think I kind of got a bit more into, um, gosh, I'm just trying to think. I, I remember being massively into Alanis Morissette at one point. <laughs> um, and um, gosh, every single band that I was into has literally just gone from my head. But um, yeah, there was a bit of a change when I, um, as I started growing up, but I'm still really actually quite heavily influenced by some of those early records that I used to listen to as a, as a child. Um, yeah, yeah. Jenna Cohen with the lyrics and stuff. Yeah. So was it mainly mainly guitar based, singer songwriter type stuff that you were? A lot of it, yeah. Joni Mitchell, Lena Cohen, that kind of stuff. Yeah. When I was listening to some of your stuff today, um, I, I could hear some sort of uh, bits of Tori Amos in some of them. It's quite, oh. yeah. yeah. Do you know what? I was introduced to Tori when I first moved to London. Hmm. Um, I stayed in a room next door to. Uh, somebody called Tom who became who I didn't know at the time but he became one of my best friends and he actually introduced me to Tori when I was when I first moved to London and um yeah always enjoyed her music as well yeah um, were you in many bands when you were growing up or did you did you go um, to perform and record on your own or play on your own I I was in a few uh high school uh like um bands <laughs> and um huh were they good 
I think they were okay. I think they were, I had, a, I think they did what bands are supposed to do when you're in school. Like we were, we had fun. Um, yeah. I was in one with two other girls and, um, and really enjoyed that. And I used to play with a drummer called Ollie. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was in a couple of things, but I, my first gig that I ever played was at the YMCA in Essex when I was 14. And that was on my own, just me and my, my little guitar. <laughs> Wow. Is that a bit daunting? I think because I was, you know, young, it wasn't at all. I was just excited to like to mm. have a go and and play a few of these songs that I'd written and see what people thought and stuff. So at the time it wasn't daunting. If you asked me to do it now, I'd be terrified. But at the time I just <laughs> <doing it. laughs> confidence of youth. Yeah. Yeah. Take me back. <laughs> did did you always want to be a, a performer? pop star um you think of yourself as a pop star no I think of myself as a songwriter and I think that's what I always wanted to do and kind of set out to do was to write songs um that's the thing I I actually I have a quite a difficult relationship with performing and being on stage now um I haven't done it uh, for, for a little while obviously I did the the TV um Jules Holland recently but that was the first gig that I've done in about four or five years I think um and yeah I I my happy place is when I'm in the studio surrounded by gear and you know working <laughs> working on writing music um and recording I think of myself as a songwriter and a recording artist primarily and that's kind of where where what I set out to to be is that your safe place? Is that your comfort blanket wrapped in the studio? Is that it's the happiest place? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, could you tell us about your uh, your time at the the Brit Academy and and how that the influence that had on you as a songwriter? Sure. Um, so, I was living in Essex and uh, writing these little songs, and I had just finished my GCSEs. And I couldn't study music. I knew I wanted to study music, but I wasn't able to study at my local sixth form college because I didn't have the grades to, to do so. So um, it was suggested that I audition for Brit School. One of the, well, it is the only free performing arts school in the country um, for 16 to 18 year olds where you can uh, study, you know, really focus in and study study music. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it was a bit of a no-brainer that I auditioned for it because I knew that I wanted to study music and it was kind of the only place that I could have, it was my only option. Yeah. Um, so I did the audition and I failed the music theory three times, but I turned up with um, about eight or nine books full of my little scribbled songs and played them in the audition. And um, I think they just, took pity on me and thought well, I don't know where else she's gonna go so they let me come in but it's um it was a great place to be it's one of those um it's one of those very special places that takes people from every single walk of life and you don't have to have necessarily had loads of private tuition to get in you just you need to to be super passionate about what you do and you know have that first and foremost and it's just a very inclusive um place so I when I was offered uh the opportunity to study there it felt very different to my previous school that I had been in um and they really sort of just supported me but um but yeah it was a, it was a bit of a crazy time in my life I was 16 I just moved to London got a, a room in a in a house share <laughs> and um yeah it was it was different times yeah so did that does that cover um, writing, performing, and the the technical producing side as well? Is it the whole? Uh, they were covering very broadly little bits, but they didn't have many songwriters actually on the course. I think they had a lot of singers, and but they weren't solely doing um, lessons in songwriting. But I think that's changed now. Actually, they um, they have a whole strand now for uh, music tech. They have a uh, um, strand for music and I think that they also are teaching or beginning to teach um yeah composition and, and songwriting in that way as well so yeah yeah so you were 
still very young when your first single was released, um, Glory Hallelujah, 2005. Do you yeah. remember how excited you felt when that release came out and it's got your name on? Uh, yeah, I, I remember just thinking, this is the weirdest. <laughs> um, I, do you know what I felt? I felt a huge amount of relief because I had left Brit school at 18 and... I basically, I, ha I had no choice. Like I had to, I had to work in music. And when it first came out, I, I, I did feel a huge amount of relief that, oh, you know, at least what I was kind of working for her, you know, I, at least I put something out into the world. And, and um, yeah, I felt really proud of it at the time. It's so funny because I listen to it now and I'm like, I feel like super, um, kind of protective over the, <laughs> the baby poly but yeah it's um it's interesting to l listen to it we we can't find it we've tried to find it digitally we can't find it anywhere i think it came out before itunes and everything like i yeah. think oh maybe i say that it i think it came out on cd mm -hmm. and i i have a, one copy <laughs> somewhere oh, okay. <laughs> um but it was a very limited edition. Uh, it came out, uh, it was released from a shed, pretty much a shed studio in Leatherhead, um, a little tiny label um, run by a guy called Greg Walsh who, who, um, who signed me. And yeah, it was, it was uh, a very uh, DIY release. Really. Right. Okay. Well, we've been trying to find out. It would have been nice if we could have played it on the show, but we haven't been able to find it. I found yeah. on, on YouTube, someone's got a copy of um, uh, a white vinyl version of it, and they're playing the B side, but not the A side. So. I think I think that was it. It came out on white vinyl. Yeah. yeah. Someone's playing it happily on YouTube. But. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, okay. So after grad graduation, you met Neil Ferris, who became your manager, and he introduced you to Daniel Miller. That doesn't happen every day, does it? Um, mm -hmm. So... Was it was that the point you thought in your career that it's it's really getting serious now? It's or I don't think I've ever thought it's getting serious. <laughs> oh really? Okay. Oh, I'll, I'll put it another way. I mean, was we were aware of of Daniel Miller and Mute at that time? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's an absolute legend, and um, yeah, to it was basically uh, I was playing a gig somewhere in London, and Neil said, "Oh, I've invited." Daniel and, and meet down to, mm -hmm. to watch you just before the show. And I remember just, thinking, <laughs> oh, God. Um, Thanks. and, and I played this gig uh, and then came off stage. And I remember um, Joff, the, um, one of the, the A&R guys there said, let's, let's chat, let's go get a drink. And, and they said that they would like to work with me straight after that gig, actually. Wow. So, yeah, it was great. And um, obviously being sort of mentored by Daniel is was super, super special. And it, it gave me really the education <laughs> that, um, that, that money can't buy. Yeah. Did they buy the drinks, by the way? I, I would imagine so. <laughs> <laughs> was it all a blur now? <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> okay. So what, what was the whole experience like making your first album and, and having the mute label behind you at that time? Um, so uh, what was it like? It was, they were based in Harrow Road at the time. I was living in a studio flat in um, Kentish Town. I just moved from Streatham and I would drive, no, so I started getting the bus from Kentish Town to Harrow Road every morning and then I'd go in um, and their studio was at the top of the building um, so you'd walk past everyone I'd always recorded my vocals in my flat on a little like condenser mic into a mini display you know I didn't even have a laptop and there they were just very patient and showed me gently how how things can can sound and how to to work in that kind of a setting and yeah it's it was a lot of fun right uh, you, your second album um followed on four years later was it the the infamous difficult second album or had you learned much from your making your first album did you find it an easy process for the second one or was it that difficult second album 
I think I felt a was it a difficult I had a really enjoyable time writing the songs but I remember feeling a little bit of pressure from it wasn't really coming from label I think slightly pressure management's sort of saying it would be good to have a radio record <laughs> you know a radio song yeah. and I've never been somebody that can write in that way I just kind of yeah. I have a flow when I go with it and and so I remember slightly having that in the back of my head and I think any difficulty um came from that place but that I would say I threw myself into the writing of it and I took myself into different places because the first album had been so long in the making, you know, I had all these songs from, I had like 800 songs from when I was a teenager. And then suddenly to, to create this new album from nothing, I was like, I, I need to like feed my imagination. So I went to Berlin um, for a little bit and recorded there. Um, I went to just different places in the UK and recorded. Um, it was, by lucky coincidence that I met Glenn whilst um, working on a different project. We were both based in Kentish Town and a friend said, I, I was looking for somebody to record um, something that I was doing for like an advert pitch thing. And somebody said, oh, you should meet my friend Glenn Kerrigan. He, had, he was also in a band called They Don't Sleep and they introduced us. And then we started writing together. And I think that was the, that was the thing that really, um, it was a catalyst for Arrows. Um, because he wrote in a way that um, I found very inspiring. And I was also secretly falling in love with him. <laughs> Aww. So, that was, so Arrows was kind of like that sort of, you know, um, it worked in that way. It was, it was difficult that once it was written, it, you know, but the actual writing process was fun. Sounds like Arrows. That's so sweet. <laughs> Similar story. Did he know you were secretly? No, I don't. I don't think he had a clue. It took him ages. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, um, did you meet James Chapman of Maps at the Short Circuit Festival? Is that, and then is that how you decided to get together and collaborate on the project that became On Dead Wings? Yeah. So, um, I I had known James. Uh, since my debut album because we were both recording at the Harrow Road in the Mute Studio around the same time he was recording his debut then as well and then when the Short Circuit Festival happened Daniel basically said why don't you two try working together and Daniel has this sort of um, brilliant way of he has a foresight knowing what works, you know, he, he sort of puts people together in a very clever way. And at the time I was like, okay, well, you know, let's, let's have a go. And, and I think James was the same. And so he came around to our, um, to our little flat and we set up in the living room and had a few run throughs and then played, played the short circuit festival at the roundhouse. And yeah, he came around to, to the living room. We, we played um, and then we played the, the gig at the roundhouse and I really enjoyed working with him. He has a really calming energy and I think he felt the same way. And we both said after that collaboration that we would love to work with each other. But I think I was right in the middle of doing um, arrows things or writing arrows and he was in the middle of promo for one of his records. And so the, the, the diaries didn't quite work out. But then about, I guess, a, a few years after that, um, we we ended up writing on Dead Waves and, and and writing that album together. Well, I was there at the Roundhouse. Oh, what what a weekend it was, huh? Fan girl, girl moment. Oh, <laughs> oh my god, that's good radio, isn't it? That's a photo from yeah. the Roundhouse. <laughs> we do this quite a lot. Um, photos on the radio. Absolutely loved the set that you did with that. Did you have a, an iPad? I vaguely recall. Did yeah, I like I I had this. On stage, and you're, it was great. But that that version of Bonnie Club, but I'll, I'd have loved to have had a recorded version of that because it is just we love amazing. Bonnie Club. Amazing. Bonnie Club's great. Thank you. We had we had a lot of fun actually working working on that set, and the whole the vibe of that weekend was just so fun, wasn't it? It was such a great party from start to finish. It was pretty cool. Mm. Sound good. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, so in, in 2017, you were approached by Bruce Woolley, 
one of the original writers of the video, Kill the Radio Star, um, to record vocals for his new Radio Science Orchestra version of the song, uh, released under the Dark Star name. How, how did that come about? That seems like um, a... Did, were you aware of the, of the Buggles song? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I used to listen to them at school in art lesson. We had one teacher who would allow the radio to be on, and that was the song that <laughs> always played. <laughs> um, yeah, it was so, played a lot. I was definitely aware of them. And um, so, yeah, he contacted me. He's a friend of my, my dear friend, Daniela. Mm. And he, um, he got in touch with me, I think, through her and asked if I would be interested in, in recording a new version of the song. Mm. I thought that sounds like a lot of fun. So we went down to his studio and... Um, and we just played. We spent a long time just messing around with sounds and vocals. And he has an amazing theremin and just, you know, having having fun. And then the song just, it emerged quite organically um, and fairly quickly. We, we spent a long time after that playing around with the video and producing it and stuff. But the actual idea came pretty quickly. We like it a lot. We do like it, yeah. It's a really interesting take on it because we love the song anyway in its, in its original raw format. But yeah, he, taking it to a new place, it's lovely. Yeah, he's a wonderful man to work with, actually. He, he has such a deep like understanding of um, sound and electronic music and stuff, but he's so open to ideas and he has a really good energy. So it's like anything that you come up with. I remember yeah. saying, can we have a go at like, doing a, an orchestra of voices and it's like yes <laughs> let's do that <laughs> and then instantly the mic's all there and we're doing it and yeah it was a, it was such a fun project to, to work on yeah so you've taken a, re a really excellent um sort of textbook pop song and made it as if adults had written it and performed it it's like <laughs> do you know what I mean it's like <laughs> it's like grown-up version it's great <laughs> I do like the original but yeah it, it's taken oh. it to a new place we like it yeah it's good. Oh so your, your current album, In This Moment, it's quite dark in places and thought-provoking. Quite a lot of places. Um, there's a feeling of self-empowerment to it, but also it's quite vulnerable in, in, the, in the lyrics. So it's like a storyteller's album. Mm -hmm. um, more something you play from start to finish, really, rather than pick individual tracks out. It's a, a, a whole story. Yeah. yeah. How long did it take you to make that album? Um... I, I think it took about a year. It was one of the faster albums to write, actually. Um, I started writing it just before I had my, well, a couple of the tracks actually I wrote maybe, yeah, I, I think the majority of the album was written just before I had my daughter and then we started recording it a few weeks, yeah, a few weeks after she was born. And this tiny person in my life, I. I think the recording process was much, um, it was much more uh, concentrated. So I didn't have the opportunity to go off like I usually do and waft off to Berlin and like fiddle around with synthesizers for four months. Instead, <laughs> I was like, you know, upstairs <laughs> writing a song and then, you know, sleeping for two hours and being a mom and burning some fish fingers and then going back upstairs and writing something else. So it was it was the, the the brief windows that I had to work in were small. And I remember thinking I've really got to make them count. And so for that reason, I think it was actually written much faster than a lot of my previous previous albums. That must be difficult, sw switching on and switching off and when you've got chaos over there and burning fish fingers and, and feeding and nappies and, and you've got, you know, a, an album to do over here. That must be quite a difficult juggling thing, isn't it? I mean, yeah, it's, I, I think it's one of those things that when you're doing it, you just kind of get on with it. Like, I remember thinking this is weird, you know, at points, <laughs> you know, um, I should probably be sleeping, but I know that I have this thing to finish. And I remember it was quite intense, um, but I've never been that great at sleeping anyway. So in a way, it was just kind of, I don't know, it just felt like the right time to start start working. I was at home and, you know, it was, it, I enjoy, I, I love, I love writing. I love music. And I, and I feel like actually a, becoming a mum was a huge part of that record, you know, with Bloom and a lot of it is about the journey um, 
of becoming a mother. And I think that, yeah, it just felt like the right time to record it. So is the next album going to be called um, The Difficult Four-Year-Old or something like that? <laughs> I'm going to say, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really but, great time. <laughs> You, you recently worked, uh, uh, name dropping all over the place now, aren't we? But yeah, William Orbit um, on Colours Colliding, that, that, that's another pretty cool project, isn't it? And appearing with Jules Holland. See, that's two things that I've never done that I would love to do, and now I never will. So thank oh, you for that. that. How, 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 how did the William Orbit thing come about? Well, do you know what? It's funny that you said that will never happen because I, I said to my manager about a year ago, I was like, I... I was joking. I was like, I don't feel like I'm ever going to be able to play live again because at the time I was having this huge stage fright thing. I said the only thing I would ever consider would be like Jules Holland and that was an absolute <laughs> <laughs> no, a joke and he laughed at me and he was like, okay, fair enough. Great manager. <laughs> <laughs> and then when that, when it came up, I was, um, yeah, it was just one of those crazy things. Um, I've forgotten the, the beginning of the question, sorry. How did the working with uh, William Orbit on the Colours Colliding um, um, so I've known William for a lot of years because I co-wrote a song on Katie Miller's album The House um, and he produced that record so we met working on that and at the time it was around when I was writing Arrows or just after it had been released and I played him Colours Colliding and I remember he was really um, supportive at the time and really enjoyed it um, and he said to me, I would love to work on that track with you. And I sort of, wow. <laughs> and that'd be great. Right then. <laughs> um, but then nothing. Well, don't mess with it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like so many things, like nothing happened, nothing came of it. You know, he's, he's very busy, obviously. And, and I, he, I was just flattered that he enjoyed the song enough to have said that in the first place. And that was kind of it. Um, and then... Yeah, all these years later, uh, we've remained in contact uh, here and there and stuff, but he, he sort of phoned up a few uh, about a year ago and said, would I consider him reworking reworking the track and in a sort of neoclassical style? And um, could I send him any ideas? And so um, Glenn, who I, who I work with now mainly as, as a co-writer and producer, he got in the studio and sort of started coming up with this piano line that he sent to William and then William was sending things back and this whole kind of collaboration started and then William said leave it with me <laughs> and I'll be back and then he kind of went quiet for a little while and I was thinking uh, you know maybe it's just maybe he maybe he's <laughs> to it you know <laughs> um, and then he sent an email probably a good like year later maybe six yeah a, a long time after the initial flurry of emails and ideas and said I've I've done it <laughs> and um and wow. sent me his version and yeah I mean it's it's absolute magic isn't it it's it's did you say I don't want it now it's too late <laughs> it's um no it's, with Robbie Williams now <laughs> it's, it's William Orbit magic isn't it so it was yeah. it was I was really um, honoured to, to sort of be a small part of what yeah. is going to be a very special album. Right. You've just um, prompted me for another question now, so I'm going to, I'm going to butt into another one now. Um, your podcasts with Katie Miller, um, that's a nice project, isn't it? It's a nice, interesting little thing. Is that, is that relaxing? Do you enjoy doing that? Absolutely love it, yeah. It's the best thing. I mean, it's basically just speaking to musicians and deep diving into everyone's creative process and everybody everybody is so different aren't they and they all have such yeah. different ways of writing and it's fascinating you know you get to really like understand the inner workings of people's minds and and also for albums that you know and love you suddenly get this whole new layer of listening to them and you're like oh I hear that you know and it's yeah it's been a really great project that started off just being me and Katie just kind of chatting away on the phone and then we thought we'd we'd start recording them and chatting to other people so yeah it's been a yeah. great project yeah isn't it lovely when you're when you're chatting with someone and uh, it's happened a few times where 
the artist that you're chatting with has said, oh, I've never been asked that before. And you go, yes. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. or, or they say, um, or they say, oh, I really like that. I'll use that in my next thing. And you think, oh, my God. It was Jean-Michel Jarre said, I'm going to use your, I'm going to use that in my next thing. I'm going to use that. Said, oh, my God. Uh, You'll tell everyone. It is wild, isn't it? Because when you start having these conversations yeah. with other musicians, you know, and it becomes quite, you, I always find the first five or ten minutes, like, you know, the, the, it takes a little while to just, like, find a flow. And yeah. then suddenly when, when they start talking about the thing that the drive, what makes them yeah. get up in the morning and, and go into the studio and sit often in solitude for 10 hours recording a bass line or whatever it is. And suddenly it's like, it's just lovely having that conversation and that connection with people because it is quite solitary as well. You know, as, as you know, being a musician, it's, it's, you don't get to chat to many people quite a lot of the time if you're in the studio on your own. So it's been yeah. a lot of fun being on that. And when you do, when you speak to non-musicians, they don't, they don't care really. <laughs> they, don't, they, don't, they don't get it. Why do you do that for? What's the, point? What's the point of that? It's on the telly. I mean, what's the matter with you? You don't go out. Yeah. What, with the Jules Holland show, is there any other TV and radio appearances that you've done that are particularly memorable? Are you quite happy doing these promotional activities? Yeah, I mean, it, it the Jules... Um, the Jules Holland TV show was like an absolute dream, you know, it's I've yeah. grown up watching this show and to be part of it felt like an absolute, yeah, it was a dream come true. Um, I guess memorable moments and, and shows and stuff. I, one of my favorite that always brings to mind is Somerset House. Um, I did a gig supporting Goldfrap a few years ago now, and that was such a, beautiful spot to play you know and it was a lovely crowd of people and we had a lot of fun but in terms of things coming up I've kind of I just released an EP that in the absence of light EP with Jim Sklavunos and I'm now kind of head down and starting to get back into studio land um to to I guess write what might become a <laughs> become a new album so can you tell us, with your, when you're songwriting, do you have a process that you go through for each of your songs? Is, is it like a, a, well, a, a, a process or, or does it, is it different every time? Does... Um, I think it usually starts with a chord progression and a line. Sometimes it's, sometimes the line comes to me before the music. So I'll be driving and maybe, or often I read something, you know, I'm like, oh, that's a really lovely word mm. that's a cool way of putting something like it's it's a great line then I have that I have a million notebooks with lines <laughs> lines of lyrics and then I usually sit down and play a chord cool progression um pretty, usually something super simple <laughs> and and get it down that way and then we slowly I mean we're super lucky because we have the studio now so um, I usually work with Glenn and he will um, listen to the idea and sort of, you know, play a bass line with it or some drums and we slowly start kind of getting a picture of what the song could be. But most of them begin with with me and a, and a piano to start with, just real skeleton format, you know, me kind of yeah. getting, getting all the notes wrong and <laughs> trying, to, trying to kind of piece it all together. I'm picturing you like dinner with your friends and then you suddenly go, I've got to go. And you bolt out to the studio and lay something down and come back. Do you keep doing that? Is that what you keep? Are you watching so it, TV and you get an idea and you just run out and put it down? Or? It, that hasn't happened yet. But I <laughs> had one moment where I was trying to, it was actually a, a song called Cocoon. And it came to me when I was sitting on the 134 back to Camden. And I was like, I haven't got a notepad and pen. And it, at the time it was before... I even had an iPhone. <laughs> so I phoned my house answering machine, <laughs> sang, sang the line into the machine. And so I didn't forget it when I got home. It's good job no one picked it up. <laughs> I, I always, I that loved song would never have, never have in the light of day. Hello, what? Oh. I think it was probably the only message that was ever left on that answer. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever used the phone. <laughs> Very creative. Oh. Um, so other than your musical 
loves and your podcasting and your burning of fish fingers and, and child motherhood do you have time for any other interests or and you mentioned earlier you do painting for fun um other interests i i love yeah i mean i i i'm really into ceramics <laughs> which sounds oh. kind, of, kind of dorky but i i'm not very good at it but i love um I love, I've started going to a class and um, I find it really meditative and um, yeah, that's kind of a, a little side thing that I really enjoy. Um, but I do, I feel like with music, it's the thing that I just, um, yeah, it's the thing that kind of, I, I don't think of it as a job. I just, I enjoy doing it, you know, um, and, and actually working with other people you know, I've done quite a few guest, um, like featured artist things recently on other people's tracks, like with Chris Liebing and Book of Shade and stuff. And that almost feels like doing a little side project hobby because it's so different and out of the, the musical world that I usually work in. It's almost like going on a little mini break and, and having a, a good, a good, you know, brain. Um, what's the word? Like exploring something totally different and then coming back to it to real life. So when you do your ceramics, when, when you make a really bad one, do you keep it? Yeah. I was going to say, do you say your daughter does? <laughs> <laughs> do you know, I made some for the, I made some for Christmas a couple of years ago and they were so bad oh. that, <laughs> that Glenn said, actually, I think we're just going to have to go out to M&S and buy everyone wine. <laughs> so, oh. so they Because they shrink when they go into the kiln. So I'd made everyone like little um, sake glasses but they ended up being more like weird wonky egg cups. <laughs> um, right. And but fans would buy them. You could put them on your website. Put them on your web. Just sign them. Put them on your website. I think you did it. It's just modern art. Say you're modern, modern artist to sign it. You could be a whole new line for you. All right. about marketing. Yeah. Get on Patreon. <laughs> Get on Patreon. They'll buy it on that. They'll buy anything on Patreon. Yeah. There you go. You can have that one. Oh, oh I'll get the good one then. All right. Brilliant. Okay, uh, we've got some interesting questions now. Not that the others weren't, but I mean, these are better. Uh, what's the weirdest or most unusual gift that you've been given by a fan? Wonky sake cup. Wonky sake cup, yeah. Uh, the most unusual gift that I've been given by a fan. Do you know what is coming in? I mean, this isn't unusual, but it's really sweet. I got sent a... Um, a little mug which I actually use all the time. I ha I use it every morning, and it's got a little N for nitrogen pink on it, and it's bright pink. And every time I do a mug, I actually think of the person who sent it to me, which was super sweet. But um, I get sent a lot of lovely art as well, like artists who have ceramics, <laughs> mini egg cups in the post being sent back to me. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I get sent, um, yeah, people's people's sort of um, artwork that they have done when, um, yeah, listening to, to my music, which I always love so much. It's not all dark, is it, in devils and scratchy <laughs> things, is it? No. No, well, that's good. It's <laughs> colourful, actually. <laughs> good. That's good. I wasn't suggesting, I was just uh, making sure. <laughs> okay. Um, what is the worst gig? you've ever been to what oh, I've been to I thought you were going to say that I've ever done uh well either really uh okay well I'm you've been there so. I'm gonna say the worst one I've ever done because I'm not gonna be mean to another musician who's having a hard day <laughs> <laughs> the worst one I've ever done was at uh I think it was one of the festivals I can't remember exactly which one but I had a click in my ears with a with cues and a backing, which was about four bars out <laughs> with, oh. the rest, with the rest of the band. <laughs> oh. I only realised, you know, with a festival, you have no no soundtrack and no real time to work anything out, and and it's only me that could hear inside my ears. <laughs> and um, yeah, I just remember thinking, this is not this is not good. <laughs> Please say exit from that one. Say it's on YouTube. Yeah, probably. Oh, God. Yeah, it's always on YouTube, isn't it? <laughs> oh, we've got a quick fire round. 
Right. Twix or curly whirly? Twix. Oh. Cheese and onion or salt and vinegar? Salt and vinegar. Strawberry cheesecake or cheese and biscuits? Cheese and biscuits. Okay. Wow. Okay, we may come back to that. <laughs> Have you ever forgotten your words on stage? All the time, yeah. <laughs> constantly <laughs> I have the worst memory if you haven't worked that out from this interview <laughs> have, what interview <laughs> the worst memory and I actually often have to have my lyrics written on paper somewhere oh, we did that we do that yeah yeah oh good don't worry about it oh, yeah. if, if, if anyone says anything I say oh I have memory problems and then they oh I'm really sorry it's fine I say well they're mine <laughs> yeah <laughs> What have you got? <laughs> Next question. Yeah. Kittens or puppies? Puppies. Mm. I have my dog, Maggie. Aww. What flavour is she? She's half border collie, half husky. Oh, wow. Mm. She is, yeah. I'm trying to think what name that is. Mm. Busky. <laughs> <laughs> Busky. Um, okay, uh, Adele or Annie Lennox? Oh, I love them both, but I'm gonna say. Um, All right, which, which one would you buy the record of? Uh, Annie Lennox. Which one would you rather go out with the girls on a Saturday night with? Annie Lennox. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one. What's your favorite cocktail? Uh, my favourite cocktail is a, well, I mean, I love them all, but probably a, uh, a martini or a, I mean, I'm drinking an apple spritz right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm a cocktail girl. Yeah, we love cocktails. We were walking back from a late night out for the night and we just happened by in Stratford upon avon the 1940s cocktail bar, which we'd never seen before. It just appeared. And it had neon signs and we went in and there was a girl there with red lippy on and the dress and, and serving copious quantities of cocktails and we just... Really Do you know, you painted that picture and now I'm, I'm going to say margarita would be my all-time favourite. Great. So yeah. is that you... Would you enter the Eurovision Song Contest? I mean, as Polly Scatterford singing. Well... We've got a reputation now, you know. <laughs> How amazing was it? The, uh, it was the brilliant, wasn't it? I was a really nice guy and it was a good song and, and people voted. <laughs> I was really sad because I went to bed because I was like, well, obviously we're not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you'd think that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Well. Then Yuppie was like, we nearly won. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was a shame. Well, yeah, I mean, Ukraine got the vote be because everyone's nice to Ukraine. It, it was an OK song, but I don't think it was. I don't think it's actually the best. Sorry, Ukraine. But it wasn't the best. Ours was the best. Um, okay, um, that's the end of the quick fire. Okay. Um, so slow fire now. Uh, are you working on any music at the moment? You've got your EP that you're touting around like nobody's business, which is lovely. Downloaded that today. Paid for it. Thank you. Thank um, you. Very nice. So are you working on any new, any new stuff that you can tell us about? Um, so I, uh, well, I'm doing a, I have a Patreon page which um, I offer everyone who is a Patreon uh, exclusive EP. Um, so I've been finishing that, but I also went into the studio last week um, to kind of start getting into album land. Um, we Ooh. sketched out a few, a few tracks um, and I'm, I'm excited actually. I went in with a, a, somebody called Nick DiCarlo who has a studio down in Ramsgate and he's a brilliant producer. And he, um, yeah, he, he gave me some of his time and we, we played with, we actually went to a, a record shop and bought some old vinyl and played with them, um, just manipulating it. And yeah, we had a lot of fun for the day. Great. So is that the My Burning Fish Finger album? <laughs> No, she's at school now, so I'm fine. Uh, more time. More time. Yeah. <laughs> so after your um, Jules Holland performance, do you think that's kind of helped you with your inhibitions about performing again? And would you consider sort of, sort of tour 
or any other live performances? I mean, more- never say never. Like I, I, I definitely would consider things, yeah, but it, it has to be the right thing, you know? Um, and I want to, if I do a, a gig or a show, I want it to be the right, the right, um, the, I, I want the venue to be right and the, 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 the gig to be good, you know? Um, I, I never do anything half-hearted. And at the moment, you know, my heart is very much in the, the recording side of, side of things. So yeah, that's so right. So you're not quite ready then? You're not, not ready unless it's... If somebody said play a gig tomorrow, I, I probably wouldn't be ready, but yeah. <laughs> Maybe the day after. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I played a lot, you know, all of my teenage years and most of my 20s, I, I played and played and played. And, I'm, and I am kind of enjoying, I wouldn't say being super, like, like just like take time to write the, the music and, and get it out there in, in the way that I want to do it. Um, have I met you both before? Have you come to a gig or something? Because I feel like I really recognise both of your faces. Well, Bridget did. We're, yeah. we're just really common people. We're, we're yeah. everywhere. We're all over the internet. So, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I love, I love listening to some of Big Satsuma, some of the, um, the, shows when you sent me that link i tuned in and was was listening whilst i was wandering around it's good oh thank you, oh, thank you. yeah we're, we're just we've just started so there were we were all at artifact radio in mexico city and um we weren't in mexico city. no we, we weren't we weren't <laughs> we weren't very happy uh or none of us and so um yeah there were was it 10 or 11 from the station that went at the same time and we said we're going to start a station they went oh well we'll come with you all right oh now we've got a station okay and then we've got some others that have joined and a few others that are joining. So yeah, it's um, early days, but. It's um, super cool. I love the whole ethos, but like the, yeah. the stuff on the website, I thought it would look great. You are the first virtual sofa. Yeah. Sure. Oh, on Big Satsuma. The yeah. very first very one. Nice. Very, Thank you for First of many. I'll be queuing up now, I tell you, after this. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. Thank it's you. Thank lovely. you for being our first uh, Big Satsuma uh, virtual sofa. Do you know um, what? Thank you for inviting me. It's been really, it's a nice way to spend the evening. Oh, thank you. We've enjoyed that. Good luck with your EP. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, we've loved it. Thank you. It's been really nice. Um, cheers. Cheers. And, uh, thank you for a lovely evening. You've consumed all of us. Oh. Yeah, gone. Yeah. Um, yeah. So have a lovely evening and good luck with the EP and everything else. Thank you so much. Thanks for having thank me. And uh, yeah, catch you both. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.